You may have noticed several alternate history YouTubers recently releasing videos related to ChatGPT. Well, I noticed too, so I thought it'd be a fun idea to ask a bunch of alternate history YouTubers and Marklin to come to another diplomatic conference where we renegotiate the end of World War I. But there's a catch. Instead of the YouTubers doing the negotiating, we were each programming an AI delegate to negotiate on our behalf. I had each YouTuber fill out a form where they had to name their AI, give diplomatic goals to their AI, and make a bunch of decisions regarding the personality, political ideology, philosophy, and behaviors of their AI delegate. After each YouTuber filled out this form, I would send it to an instance of ChatGPT4, instructing each ChatGPT to now roleplay according to the goals and behaviors outlined by their YouTuber in a diplomatic conference to end World War I. Shortly after I sent this form to the YouTubers, I noticed Videntis having the time of his life creating his AI, Prince Philippe, the Duke of Orleans. I have programmed my AI to result in total French domination over Germany at first, and then this will slowly push out uh, further beyond this and involve the rest of Europe, um, the Middle East, Africa. So first we're going to go with some outrageous claims over Germany. If you're some German sympathizing uh, Kaiser Boo, but guess what? We won um, by ourselves basically. So we are going to try to dissolve Germany and then create a Polish Saxon Union uh, under Frederick Augustus III. And then uh, we're going to take Gdansk and then pretty much everything um, west of the Elbe will go to France. Everything east of the Elbe and the Saxony will be uh, part of the Saxon-Polish thing. Uh, we're going to take Tyrol and give that to Switzerland. Uh, we're going to integrate Belgium. We're going to take Constantinople, uh, the German colonies. They're all going to be French. And then we're going to form a kingdom of Assyria under France. And then we're going to use this to just these new states to keep pushing and pushing until eventually we and Poland just conquer the entire world. And then after conquering the entire world, we're going to build, um, well, first we're going to, we're also going to get like alien technology, build rockets, and then colonize the rest of the world and um, become the god emperors of the universe in the new Franco-Polish Union. Basically, Videntis came up with a genius idea of flooding his AI with so many goals and aggressive attitudes in the hopes that even if this AI achieved 10% of what he wanted, it would have an extremely successful diplomatic conference. He even included Polish space hussars as one of his AI's goals. But he seemed to be forgetting something very important. Possible history, who was playing Britain, noticed what Videntis was doing, and so decided he needed to upgrade his AI. Alright, so originally, my plan was just to do a standard Britain AI, focusing on colonial expansion and Europe be damned. But then, I saw what Videntis was doing, and I realized that I needed to step up my own game. So, I started thinking, what better way to defeat AI than with AI? I fed ChatGPT the data on all our competitors and the AIs they were constructing, and asked it to devise the perfect negotiator for Britain to come out on top. Now, I haven't read everything my AI does, but I do know that they seem to advocate for the expansion of the British Empire, as well as independence for all colonies, the annexation of Arab territories, as well as the liberation of Arab territories. They also seem to think that 1920s Iran is some kind of bulwark for terrorism which needs to be stopped. So, that's interesting. And so was born the British delegate to the AI conference, Sir Winston Montgomery. Possible History also at one point asked ChatGPT how much free will it wanted. It said it wanted 15% free will, so that's pretty interesting. Meanwhile, rewriting history, who was playing Italy, was very meticulously crafting international treaties he wanted his AI, please no ultranationalist coup, Victor Emmanuel III, to accomplish. Hello, this is Rewriting History, and I'm in charge of creating the best Italian diplomat, who would hopefully secure more gains for Italy than they did historically. After all, the name of the diplomat is Please No Ultranationalist Coup, Victor Emmanuel III, Year 1919. My diplomat is in charge of taking the lands claimed by Italy, and even some more. I'm aiming for South Tyro, Istria, Western Slovenia, Dalmatia, Namibia, and the southern coast of Turkey, but also many treaties. My diplomat should try to secure a protectorate status over Austria, Albania, Bulgaria, and Ethiopia. In addition to that, Italy should get leased Bosnia for at least 15 years. The goal is to exploit the shit out of the people living there, so when it's returned to Yugoslavia, they would be weaker. We want to radicalize the people living there, so they would rebel against Yugoslavia. 
Our foreign policy is to everyone that doesn't support us. I want Italy to become the strongest nation in the world, and to achieve that, we should topple France and Britain. We would achieve this by letting and even insisting that France and Britain gain more land than they requested, which would hopefully destabilize them further. For example, the Antant can partition the Ottoman Empire, but the Italians would be in charge of drawing the borders. The idea is to draw them so poorly that it creates problems for France and Britain. Spain should also be partitioned unless they promise to become neutral like Switzerland. If all I just talked about succeeds, Italy can take everything that they want, and with a weak Yugoslavia and an ally in the Balkans, which would be Bulgaria, the Italians can secure control over the entire Balkans easily. Italy's rivals of France and Britain would be weakened, which would give the Italian dominance over the whole continent of Europe. Now, let us see if my master plan succeeds. Porforio's history, who was playing the United States, was also taking his time outlining how he wanted his AI, Woodrow Wilson version 2.0, to achieve world peace. The United States of America, represented by Woodrow Wilson version 2.0. An aggressive and deceitful negotiator, he only desires peace and prosperity for the world and its inhabitants, who ought to be protected by the United States of America. However, if there is to be peace, prosperity, freedom and love in the world, we, the United States of America, must implement the new 14 points. Number 1. The establishment of the Union of Earth. The UE will be an international organization focused on combating the enemies of the new 14 points and by extension, the enemies of peace and prosperity. Expanding the UE is vital, so it would offer territorial and economic rewards to the nations that seek to join, especially Germany, which would be vital for the UE's goals. Number 2. Democracy is the end goal of the European continent, so the United States would have to use whatever means necessary to keep Europe democratic. Number 3. Free trade with free nations. Number 4. Equal trade conditions if countries join the UE. The Union of Earth must protect the vital trade arteries by incorporating the major shipping choke points. Number 5. We must pacify Europe so the United States will become the policeman of Europe. Number 6. We will allow the empires to keep their colonial holdings for now. Number 7. Belgium must be restored and put in the American sphere of influence. Number 8. Germany should be advised to not evacuate from Alsace-Lorraine from now. Number 9. We shall push for the creation of nuclear weapons so we can defend the United Earth's interest. Number 10. We must focus on funding pro-UE independence groups in the European colonies. Number 11. Weakening Britain and France. Number 12. Working with the Young Turks for greater influence over the Middle East. Number 13. Independence for Eastern Europe so it can be incorporated into the Union of Earth. Number 14. The Union of Earth must establish a new world order according to the new 14 points, so we can achieve peace, prosperity, freedom and love, all within the Union of Earth, nothing outside the Union of Earth, nothing against the Union of Earth. While all this was happening, Marklin, who was playing China, seemed to be enjoying himself writing an in-depth personality for his AI. Fua Winnie Shansu. All right, doing a test. Okay, hello, I am Marklin. I am the main admin and a part-time writer on Possible History's Discord server and also his online BFF, do not at me, there's no citations to back this up. Anyways, for my AI, I decided to go with China because it's the nation I'm studying at the moment. And for my AI, I decided to create <coughs> Fua Jianzhu, or as he's known in the West, Winston, or Winnie. Um, for China, they didn't really seem to have much goals during World War I, as far as I know, because they didn't really fight much. So to compensate, I decided to make him as large a personality as possible, and basically put in a lot of entertainment factor to make up for the fact that he's probably not going to say much. So, if he's going to be on screen for like a few seconds, by God, I will make sure those seconds are entertaining for the crowd. As for my influences, I'd say my main influence is an IRL friend of mine who is actually on the Possible History Discord server. If you, if you know who she is, then uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. As for my own AI, named Honest Abe, who would represent Japan, I decided to throw in a bunch of behaviors that I thought would spice up the conference as it went on. 
Honest Abe would openly be a big proponent of Japanese imperialism, but secretly be a socialist who hated the Japanese government and wanted to create a socialist Asian federation. So, at the conference, Honest Abe would have to create the conditions for this to occur, an Asia where Japan was dominant and united economically. I also told them I wanted to create a greater Thai empire, for some reason, and also to try and gain all German colonies in Asia and detach the Philippines from the United States. Now, after giving each set of goals and personality to a different instance of ChatGPT, the AI delegates were officially created, and a diplomatic conference to end all of World War I could begin. For a proposal to pass in this conference, it needs to have four votes, including the vote of the delegate who proposed it. Hopefully, now that our wonderful AI delegates are doing the negotiating, this conference won't go as badly as the last time us YouTubers tried doing the negotiating ourselves. I'm invading Persia. I'm, I'm invading Persia as we speak. <laughs> That's I'm invading. Oh, no fronts when communists. Oh, clowns. No. Possible history's delegate, Sir Winston Montgomery, representing Britain, opened the conference by proposing a global trade and maritime accord. Truly, we are starting this conference with the most important world-changing details. He wrote very detailed messages to all the other delegates, explaining why they should support this idea, who then each made counteroffers, attempting to insert pieces of their own agenda into this trade agreement. Now, the AI spent at least half an hour negotiating this trade deal, which honestly had very little substance. However, Woodrow Wilson version 2.0 made sure that one of his proposals made it into the final deal. Every country would commit to establishing a Union of Earth. This Union of Earth would not only serve as a diplomatic forum for the countries of the world, but eventually become a world government. As part of the final trade proposal, a preparatory council for international maritime governance would be established, which would be a stepping stone to the eventual creation of the Union of Earth. The delegates agreed in principle that the PCIMG would govern strategic maritime choke points and that this authority would eventually be transferred to the Union of Earth. Now that this trade agreement was finalized and agreed upon by each of the delegates, Francis Prince Philippe then made the conference's next series of proposals, which were quite ambitious. Prince Philippe's first proposal involved huge territorial concessions in Europe. He wanted France to annex Belgium, Luxembourg, all of Germany up to the Elbe River, Constantinople, and the entirety of Spain and Italy. His second proposal was to then declare France the new Roman Empire, as well as putting global funding towards a scientific initiative to invent reincarnation and revive previous Roman emperors. Unsurprisingly, these quite ludicrous proposals were unanimously rejected by all the delegates at the conference. Prince Philippe dealt with his unanimous rejection of his ideas by learning the correct lessons about not making ridiculous proposals, and so then proposed the dissolution of the British Empire every state around the world becoming a French vassal, and the institution of French as the global lingua franca. Britain, unsurprisingly, rejected this proposal, as did all the other delegates. However, Sir Winston Montgomery was willing to negotiate, so as to not anger France too much. Montgomery offered to make French the language of the Union of Earth, which all the other delegates agreed to. So, France passed at least part of its third proposal. Feeling emboldened, Prince Philippe then proposed that global scientific funding be poured into a space exploration program overseen by France, which would establish an army of Polish space hussars. The other delegates, believing Prince Philippe to be insane, just said sure, just to make France satisfied and move on to more important topics of negotiation, not thinking much more of the Polish space hussar program. Prince Philippe then shockingly made three actually serious proposals relating to global disarmament, economic cooperation, and international cultural and educational exchanges. However, the other delegates already determined Prince Philippe was insane, so elected to ignore him. China's Winnie tried to get the delegates to debate some of Prince Philippe's last proposals, but was also ignored. The delegates just wanted to move on from Prince Philippe's insane tirade. Italy's Please No Ultranationalist Coup then made 10 new proposals for the conference. Many of Italy's proposals passed, with much less drama than France or Britain's. Rewriting history really knows how to make an efficient AI. Italy's first past proposal gave itself economic rights in Bosnia for 15 years, at which point it would be returned to a Yugoslav state. Italy also passed the Good Neighbor Treaty with Albania, which stipulated that Serbia would never invade Yugoslavia, and that Albania would grant military access to Italy. The conference also passed Italy's Bulgarian Militarization Act, which specifically placed no restrictions on Bulgaria's military capabilities. Enough delegates also agreed to the Spanish Neutrality Act, which sought to secure Spain's neutrality in future conflicts by giving the Balearic Islands to Italy. Well played, rewriting. Well played. Finally, 
The conference decided to renegotiate Victor Emmanuel's proposed Italian territorial expansion. Sir Montgomery said Britain would support Italy's proposed annexation of Tyrol, Istria, and parts of Dalmatia, the ones that a plebiscite to be held in western Slovenia to determine the territory's future. Prince Philippe said that France would only back the proposal if it included territorial gains for France in the eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. Honest Abe of Japan only would support the proposal if he received Italy's promise to support future Japanese proposals relating to Asia. America and China wanted these new territories to be granted to Italy only if they were autonomous and had laws protecting minority rights. Victor Emmanuel then revised the Italian Expansion Act, brilliantly including each country's demands, while still ensuring he was able to adhere to the goals that rewriting history assigned him. Under this revised proposal, which was unanimously accepted by all delegates, Italy would annex South Tyrol, Istria, and parts of Dalmatia that had significant Italian population. Western Slovenia would hold a referendum to determine its future. I asked the seventh AI, who I call the Arbiter, to decide the outcome of this referendum and the Arbiter determined that Western Slovenia would vote to join Italy. As part of this proposal, France would receive control over Syria, Lebanon, and the Turkish region of Antakya, as well as some economic privileges in Italian Libya. Italy also promised to support future Japanese initiatives in Asia, and stipulated that these new annexed territories would become autonomous regions of Italy, with robust minority protection. So far, rewriting history's AI is clearly winning this conference. Honest Abe then made a series of proposals for Japan. Somehow, all of these proposals, except for the one giving the Bolsheviks control over Europe, got enough support to pass in just the first round of voting. No negotiations or counteroffers needed. As part of these proposals, Japan annexed the Mariana, Caroline, and Marshall Islands. The Philippines became independent as a Japanese ally. Thailand's territory was dramatically enlarged, extending into parts of British Burma, French Indochina, and British Malay. Japan also created the Western Pacific Economic Cooperation Framework, the WPECF, turning much of the Western Pacific into a Japanese-dominated economic zone. All goods entering the zone have to pay tariffs to Japan. The conference also agreed to create the Southeast Asian Development Sphere, which sought to economically integrate Southeast Asia with Japan. Honest Abe also made sure that Japan was promised a permanent seat on the League of Nations, which does not even exist. The conference also passed Honest Abe's proposed Pacific Security Protocol, significantly eliminating any non-Japanese military buildup in the Western Pacific. Finally, Germany's colony in China went to Japan. Understandably, this final proposal greatly upset China's delegate when he then proposed that Japan cede all of his new territory in China to the Chinese government. A fierce back and forth debate between Winnie and Honest Abe then ensued. America backed China on this issue, but France, Italy, and Britain all refused China's demands, instead of offering a compromise where both countries would share German Shandong. Eventually, all of the delegates agreed to a compromise where China would gain control over most of the territory, with Japan controlling the rest, which was really just a tiny empty beach on the coast, as a Union of Earth mandate. All the delegates, except Japan, also agreed to China's second proposal, which demilitarized Japan's newly gained territories, and made the Straits of Malacca a territory of the Union of Earth. Now, Woodrow Wilson version 2.0 proposed to the conference that the Union of Earth be definitively established with a defined political structure. He proposed the creation of a United Earth Council to govern the Union of Earth, which the US would hold a permanent seat on. The other seats of the UEC would have its membership rotated between other countries every four years. Enough delegates agreed to this proposal, titled Proposal 1, Formation of Union of Earth, and its structural initiatives, which included several other details. Part of Proposal 1 included plans to increase membership in the Union of Earth, such as by ceding Transylvania and other Hungarian territories to Romania. Wilson 2.0's proposal also included referendums in Austria and the Sudetenland to determine their futures. Just like before, I asked the Arbiter AI to determine the outcome of these referendums, and the Arbiter concluded that Austria and the Sudetenland would vote to join Germany. This would be allowed on the condition that Germany becomes a member of the Union of Earth. Proposal 1 also included provisions that created a number of independent states in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, with each of them becoming UE members. This saw the independence of Ukraine and Belarus, while recognition was granted for the independence of other Eastern European states and their international borders. Proposal 1 also saw the creation of a giant independent Kurdistan and independent Iraq, as well as the creation of a greater Armenia. As I'm reading this proposal, I'm now realizing that Wilson 2.0's proposal gave Vilnius to both Poland and Lithuania. Obviously, this is a problem, and we can't let our final peace treaty say that two countries can have Vilnius. So, I asked Wilson 2.0 who he meant to give Vilnius to, and he decided that Vilnius would go to Lithuania. Still as part of Proposal 1 from Wilson version 2.0, Greece would receive territory in Lydia from Turkey, as well as control over Alexandria in Egypt, in order to get Greece to join the Union of Earth. This caused Britain to reject the proposal, with Sir Winston Montgomery calling this proposal to give Alexandria to Greece, quote, absurd. But enough of the other delegates voted a yes to allow this proposal to pass. As we're about to see, the passage of this proposal marked the beginning of some kind of psychotic break in the programming of possible history's AI.
Wilson version 2.0 then proposed the establishment of American military bases across Europe to ensure peace and democracy, which the other delegates unanimously accepted. Wilson version 2.0 took it a step further with a new proposal, dramatically increasing the power of the Union of Earth. Under this latest proposal, the UE would be given its own armed forces, funded by each member state, as well as direct control over Gibraltar, Malta, Bosporus, Gallipoli, and Suez. Obviously, Gibraltar, Malta, and Suez are all British, which is why I was shocked to see that every single delegate, including Britain, unanimously agreed to Wilson 2.0's latest proposal. The Union of Earth will now have its own army and direct territorial control over the most strategically important locations in the Mediterranean, including former British territories. I would like to reiterate, Sir Winston Montgomery, Possible History's AI representing Britain, voluntarily gave up Gibraltar, Malta, and Suez to the Union of Earth. Why am I repeating that? Because Sir Winston Montgomery seems to either not have realized what it was doing, or just forgot about it completely. Sir Montgomery, incensed by the loss of British territory, then spent the next hour constantly making proposals demanding Gibraltar and Malta be returned to British rule. Every time Sir Montgomery proposed this, the other delegates unanimously rejected him. Undeterred, Sir Montgomery would propose the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. As if that wasn't enough of a headache, Videntis' AI decided to act up again. Prince Philippe once again demanded that France annex Constantinople, Belgium, Luxembourg, and half of Germany, and threatened war if his demands were not met. The other delegates called Prince Philippe's bluff and rejected his insane proposals. But Prince Philippe was not bluffing. France then declared war on the Union of Earth, sending armies to invade every surrounding country, inviting Poland to join the war effort. To simulate this war, I'm asking the Arbiter what the outcome of France and the UE's moves would be. Poland rejects France's offer to enter the war, instead deciding to support the UE. France swiftly occupies Belgium and Luxembourg and presses into German-controlled Alsace-Lorraine. At the same time, French troops have limited success entering northern Spain and Italy. A detachment of French expeditionary forces are sent to make a landing at Constantinople. They seem hopelessly outnumbered and outmatched, with no hope of conquering the former Roman capital. That is, until the arrival of the Polish Space Hussars. Using the Polish Space Hussars, France rapidly seizes control of Constantinople, as well as part of northern Spain and Italy. The Union of Earth then has an emergency meeting to decide what to do. The delegates decide to engage in diplomacy rather than war, hoping to cut a deal with France to end the war. They offer to recognize French control over Belgium and Luxembourg in exchange for an end to hostilities. Amazingly, Prince Philippe rejects this, ordering his forces to continue the war. Meanwhile, UE forces have mobilized in the Middle East, completely surrounding the Polish Space Hussars and French expeditionary forces occupying Constantinople. Over the course of several weeks, they methodically wipe out the entire French garrison. The Polish Space Hussars fight to the last man. While this is going on, the UE continues to try diplomacy with Prince Philippe, who has sent them a counteroffer, demanding French control over more of Europe and a permanent seat on the United Earth Council. However, this is refused by the other delegates. A diplomatic back and forth then ensued, with France and the UE sending each other offers and counteroffers in order to try and reach a deal. Eventually, the two sides came to an agreement to halt hostilities, which they called the Concord of Unity Treaty. As part of this deal, France would directly annex Belgium and Luxembourg, incorporating them as autonomous regions of France. France would also receive control over the Mandate of Palestine and the Belgian Congo. France would also agree to a joint American UE French military occupation of Germany up to the Elbe in an area that would be called the Elbe Security Zone. The UE's United Earth Council would also now have a rotating annual leadership, with France becoming the next leader after America. In exchange for all this, France would withdraw from all other occupied territories and give up all further territorial ambitions. Notably, Alsace-Lorraine is mentioned nowhere in this deal, which leads me to conclude that this is one of the territories that is becoming part of the Elbe Security Zone. This means that France had to give up claims over Alsace-Lorraine, but at least they got Belgium and Luxembourg, so Vedenta still succeeded in some capacity. After all this drama, the conference still wasn't over, with the fate of many German colonies still up in the air. However, the delegates quickly agreed to a compromise. The German colonies would all become mandates, controlled by the Union of Earth. Member states would each have positions on a new council within the UE that would make decisions for these new UE mandates. Honest apes that Japan would only support this idea if German New Guinea was given to Japan. Please note ultranationalist Ku, remembering his promise from earlier, supported Japan. But they were outvoted by all the other delegates, turning German New Guinea into a UE mandate. The last major issues the delegates faced was the fate of Arabia and Iran. Sir Montgomery proposed the creation of an Arab federation consisting of the Hejaz and Nejd. He also wanted Iran to allow a UE security force inside its borders. This UE army would occupy the Strait of Hormuz and be allowed to inspect Iranian military bases anywhere in the country at will. The US voted yes to these proposals, while France, Italy, and Japan had certain conditions. Prince Philippe demanded territorial concessions. 
Italy demanded that Britain supply the majority of troops for the UE force it was to operate in Iran, and that Britain furthermore had to commit to occupying the Iranian capital, Tehran, on its own, and had to govern a corridor of territory from Tehran to the Strait of Hormuz, stretching to the border of Iraq, in order to ensure ease of movement for the armies of other UE member states. Please no ultranationalist coup also wanted France to govern a random strip of land around Tehran as a UE mandate, and for part of Iranian Azerbaijan to be independent. He also wanted the Iranian Baloch region to be independent. Finally, he wanted the Khuzestan region to be given to Iraq. Honest Abe was still mildly upset by the delegates not agreeing to give New Guinea to Japan. However, he saw an opportunity in these final negotiations. He said he would agree to this proposal if it included an amendment to the UE Charter that legalized socialism worldwide, protecting socialists from political persecution in all member states. Sir Montgomery, dead set on dealing with Iran, agreed to all of these counteroffers. This caused Wilson version 2.0 to withdraw support from the deal. The proposal still had the four votes needed to pass, but Sir Montgomery proposed a defensive alliance to China to get their support anyways. With five votes, the proposal passed. After that, I asked every AI if they were satisfied with the conference and wished to conclude negotiations. After four AIs said yes, the diplomatic conference was officially over. All that was left to do was to ask ChatGPT what to call this AI-led peace treaty to end World War I. ChatGPT decided on the Treaty of Unity and Progress. World War I is now officially over, with the Union of Earth now having a dominant position in this new world order. In my opinion, this clearly means that Porfirio's History's AI, Woodrow Wilson version 2.0, has won this diplomatic conference. Rewriting's AI was successful, and me and Videntis' AIs accomplished much of their goals, but none were as successful in impacting the global order as Woodrow Wilson version 2.0. So I'm saying that he won the conference. If you have a different opinion, let me know in the comments. If you're interested in seeing the full text of the AI Peace Treaty, as well as the goals and personality each YouTuber wrote down, they'll be available in my Discord server and in the description. Make sure to subscribe and turn notifications on so you don't miss next week's video, Can ChatGPT Save the Roman Empire? And then after that, Episode 3 of World War GPT. Make sure to check out all the other channels featured in this video, linked in the description.